डॉक्टर अहमद सर ज्वाइन होने के उनके लिए वेट करते हैं थोड़ा फाइव मिनट्स देन विल स्टार्ट आज हम तीन लड़कों का पिक्चर हेलो हाँ सर ते प्लेन मध्य है बहुत एक नेटवर्क इश्यू है मग तो जो फर्स्ट रिसोर्स पर्सन है जब इनवाइट के
uh, both the resource person have joined now. Uh, Kartik sir, shall I start? Hello. Hello. Oh. Miss Anushka Singh. You may start. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I warmly welcome our respected delegates, speakers, faculty members from various educational institutes, researchers, NGOs, students, and other stakeholders. I welcome you all in the National E-Conference on Wildlife Conservation in India. This National E-Conference is jointly organized by Department of Geology of J.M. Patel Arts, Commerce and Science College, Bhandara, M.B. Patel Arts, Commerce and Science College, Sakoli, and S.N. Moore College, Tumthar, with collaboration of Wildlife Trust of India and Envocare Nature Club. The theme of our particular conference is a special discussion on a sustainable approach towards wildlife conservation in India. Moving ahead, I would like to welcome chief organizers of National E-Conference on Wildlife Conservation in India, respected Dr. Jomne Sir, Principal of J.M. Patil College of Arts, Commerce and Science College, Mandara, respected Dr. Harish Trivedi Sir, Principal of M.B. Patel College of Arts, Commerce and Science College, Sapoli, Respected Dr. Chetan Masram, sir, Principal of SN Moore Arts, Commerce and Science College, Tum, sir. Mr. Prafula Bamburkar, Coordinator of Central India Tiger Corridor Securement Project, Wildlife Trust of India. Similarly, I take this opportunity to welcome the CF and Field Director of Nagjira Navigao Tiger Reserve, Honorable Manikanda Ramanujan, sir. Also, I would like to welcome our today's eminent speakers of technical session one and two, Dr. Mohammad Firoz Ahmed, sir, scientist F, head TRCD and HRCD, Aranya Guwahati, and Dr. Ajaz Hussain, project scientist from Ladakh, India. For a brief introduction of today's conference, I would like to request respected principal of SN Moore College, Tum, sir, Dr. Chetan Masram, sir, to give an opening remark of today's technical session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm audible, please. Yes, sir. Yes, you yes, are sir. Audible. audible. Thank you. Thank you. Dear friends, ladies and yes, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Please proceed. Sir. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, yeah, please proceed, sir. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to pay tributes to Sant Tukuruji Maharaj, Ma Saraswati, and uh, our great philanthropist, founder of Gondia Education Society, Gondia, late Sri Manorvai Patelji. A very good morning and uh, welcome to one and all. On the occasion of two-day national e-conference on wildlife conservation in India, a sustainable approach, jointly organized by Department of Geology of Gondia Education Societies, G.M. Patel Arts, Commerce and Science College, Bandara, M.B. Patel College of Arts, Commerce and Science, Sakkuli, and Seth Nasting Das Moore College of Arts and Commerce and Srimati G.T. Saraf, Science College, Tumsa. Honorable guest, and today's resource person, Dr. Mohammad Firoz Ahmad, scientist of 
8 TRCD and HRCD, Aranya Guwahati, Honorable Dr. Azaz Hussain, Project Scientist, Protected Boundary, Ladakh, India, Respected Principles of Colleges, Organizing Colleges, Dr. Vikas Domne, sir, Dr. Harish Tribedi, sir, and Mr. Prafulla Bamburka, Coordinator Central India Tiger Corridor Securement Project, Wildlife Trust of India, Convener Dr. Veena Mahajan, ma'am, Co Convener Dr. M. F. Sadhu, sir, Organizing Secretary Dr. L. P. Nagpurkar, Joint Secretary Professor Dr. C. J. Khuni, Coordinator Dr. Shyam Tafri, sir, Dr. Mahendra Raut, Field Officer, Dr. Kanchan Kaparde, Dr. Arti Sarve, Dr. J. R. Kirsan, and uh, yesterday is a very informative and great knowledge about the wildlife conservation by Mr. Honorable Mr. R. M. Ramanuzam, IFS Officer, CF and Field Director, Nazira Navigao Tiger Reserve, NNTR Gondia. Mr. Luz, uh, Jules Luis, Deputy Director, Wildlife Crime Control Division and Commons Wildlife Trust of India, WTI New Delhi. And uh, Dr. Suresh, uh, sci Senior Scientist, uh, Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. And uh, today's delegates, members, principals of various colleges, professors, scientists, researchers, students, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, uh, I feel immensely proud. While one of the pillar of organizing two-day national e-conference, uh, yesterday already. We had a very nice lecture, nice talk, nice informations, a great knowledge about wildlife by Mr. R. M. Ramazan and uh, Juice Lewis, Lewis and uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar. Today also, the topic of the conference is very much close to us Indians. Its voices. Indian ethos, Indian belief, Indian philosophy, and Indian way of life. Uh, Santa Tukara Mara says, Vrukshavalli Ama Sovide. The birds, trees, animals are the forms of God and presence of its creature. Chain of life begins from plants and going through different animals and ends at plants once again. Conserving ecology and conserving environment is the core principle of our life and soul. Uh, especially, I would point out that uh, indigenous people, tribal of India, live and thrive in forest. Plants and animals are their bosom friends and God's creature. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the second day of conference. And uh, today, we have two eminent resources with us, scientists from Guwahati, Asham, that is Honorable Dr. Mohammed Filoz Ahmed, will be talking on the important topic, wildlife conservations of Northeast India, a sustainable approach. And for second technical sessions, we have Honorable Dr. Azaz Hussain, project scientist from Ladakh, India, who will talk on wildlife conservations at tough topography of Ladakh. Our today's resource person will talk in detail. I'm not going to the detail and open the suspense of the talk presented by Honorable guest. However, will share their professional experience with us on this environmental and I request 
to share their professional experiences with us on their environmental and global issues. Whereas, uh, uh, especially, I hope we all will definitely going to prove a milestone in the long journey of protecting and conserving wildlife, thus biodiversity. We must not forget the principle of live and let others live. There is need for wildlife conservation and to have a sustainable approach for this. I, Dr. Chetan Kumar Asram, Principal of SNS Moore College on behalf of organizing colleges, I request the honorable guest to provide guidance in our humble attempts and in our spiritual share in conserving wildlife. I thank both the resource persons for giving your valuable time for this conference. I thank delegates and all others members present today's second day of the conference and for their active participations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Can I continue, sir? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, sir, thank you. Our very much objective of today's conference is to have a healthy discussion in the area of sustainable approach in wildlife conservation. And to convey this, we have our respected resource persons with us who are best in their fields and are known for their remarkable work in the area of wildlife conservation. It's my honor to introduce them. Our first speaker, respected doctor, our first speaker is respected Dr. Mohammed Firoz Ahmed, sir, head of TRCD and HRCD, Aranyak, Guwahati, Assam. Sir has been associated with Aranyak since 1994 as a volunteer and subsequently started managing conservation projects of Aranyak from 1999. Sir has completed his postgraduate from the Guwahati University, Assam, and PhD from Utkal University, Orissa. Sir has received several capacity building and professional trainings in the conservation research and conservation project management. Sir is an avid researcher and has discovered several new species of amphibians, including orange sticky frog, Assamese balloon frog, Assamese cascade frog. His team works across the Eastern Himalaya and the Northeastern region on multiple groups of species and conservation livelihood interventions. Since 2000, he has developed, managed or co-managed over 70 conservation projects with the significant contribution to biodiversity conservation in the Northeast Indian region. Currently, Sir is leading Manas Tiger Conservation Program that integrates conservation livelihoods, education, and law enforcement to secure tiger, prey animals, and habitats through the community participation. Sir also leads the participatory natural resource management program at the Kajiranga Karbi and Anglong landscape of Assam that focuses on conservation livelihoods and NRM by the indigenous Karbi community. Sir has received awards and honors in recognition to his impactful contribution to the conservation. Sir has been member to the national level statutory conservation policy bodies like uh, Forest Advisory Committee and the National Tiger Conservation Authority of the Ministry of Environment and Forest Government of India. Similarly, our second speaker, respected doctor, our second speaker is respected Dr. Ajaz Hussain project scientist in Ladakh. Sir has obtained his doctoral, de doctoral degree from Wildlife Institute of India, affiliated to Saurashtra University in Wildlife Sciences, and he holds MSc degree in the Wildlife Sciences from Aligarh Muslim University. Sir's research interests lie in the management and mitigation of human-wildlife interaction, ecosystem services, population estimation of fauna and assessment of their habitat. Currently, Sir is working with Wildlife Institute of India as a project scientist in Ladakh in under con rationalization of protected area boundary in Ladakh project. Now, moving ahead, I would like to request a respected Dr. Mohammed Firoz Ahmed, Sir, to present the first technical session. 
good morning everyone thank you good morning uh i'll just uh, i i'm logging in currently from two devices i will leave from one because i was having a technical issue as i'm in the field currently and somehow managed to connect to this conference uh, thanks to the technology and thanks to the organizer for inviting me um uh, i hope you can hear me yeah yeah welcome sir okay uh for some reason i cannot hear you but i i i'm sure you you are you are hearing me but i'll start my presentation and then i will come later on to my other device uh, to hear if any questions uh, sorry for this technical uh, minor technical issue but i think it's manageable at this moment uh, given that i am in a remote area uh, i'm presenting my slides now uh is it visible yes sir it is sir? very much visible is it okay yes. thank you yes yes it's okay doctor so yeah um, thanks for the uh, brief introduction it makes my uh, life easier a little bit to speak and start with um as all of you know north east india is a very um, um rich in very rich in cultures uh, tradition and biodiversity as well as uh, <clears throat> many other component of nature uh today uh, this talk i'm going to present uh, one case study that uh, we have uh, uh, come out of after a long um, tedious work of 6 7 years in manas landscape um which also has uh, encouraged us to experiment uh, this new model of uh, sustainable conservation approach in other parts of northeast india um so the title is aptly you know suggested by the organizer as wildlife conservation in northeast india a sustainable approach um i worked with my two senior colleagues um uh, bibuti prasad lokar and jonta kumar sharma as well as a team of uh, almost about 40 members who has been working in livelihood uh, and uh, you know natural resource management in this uh, part of the country um i'll introduce you quickly to the uh, to the biodiversity of northeast india and before that um, you can see the physiography uh, physiographical diversity and bi uh, that leads to biodiversity of uh, this region if you see this map i'm sure some of you will be able to read this map the dotted areas are plains of assam uh, in the in the center uh, then as we move north as well as south the mountains rise and on the north it's the himalayas the black areas are above 5000 meter then the white areas are um, 4000 to 5000 meter and that way we come down and as we go towards the west towards at the bangladesh border the altitude or the border between bangladesh and meghalaya state of uh, uh, or uh, india the altitude becomes 15 to 20 meters so you can imagine the physiographical diversity of this region um uh, the altitude diversity of this region which starts from 20 meters all the way beyond 5000 meters and that has created this physiological condition physiographical condition which has led to diversity of uh, ecosystems diversity of habitats diversity of uh, you know traditions and culture in this region which of course originated because of the high biodiversity and and the, that's why this region is part of uh, um, the uh, indo burma biodiversity hotspot there are two biodiversity hotspots currently in india one is western ghats and the other in northeast india but northeast india all together with myanmar is called indo burma biodiversity hotspot or also called eastern himalayan biodiversity hotspot um i will i'm starting the biodiversity with rhino because this is a uh, charismatic species and a proud of assam and um, uh, it's a pride of assam so we are uh, we are here uh, with living with about 2400 uh, you know uh, 50 plus rhinos uh, in this in this area uh, this is uh, kaziranga national park most of you know is one of the very famous for rhinos but we also have rhinos in manas pobitora orang and kaziranga then we are talking about uh, in this region about over 220 tigers um, uh, which has been uh, Uh, recently found uh, in the 2020 18 study um, and the 2022 study is ongoing at this moment on the population estimation of tiger very rich in tiger population the flat plains of assam used to be 
um, used to be one of the hotspot of tigers in the history. Uh, you won't believe uh, the uh, the um, colonial hunters uh, hunted over a year uh, 1,500 tigers in Assam itself uh, at some point of time. So that is the number of tigers in this in this. I think around 1,800 something they hunted 1,500 tigers in one year. If you if you remember. If you go, if you look into the Britishers, has records of how many tigers hunted, how many elephants hunted, how many bear hunted. Everything is there. Um, so this this region is house to many many species of uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, which includes mammals, birds, uh, and everything. And there are also small animals uh, as well: amphibians, turtles, um, snakes and lizards, butterflies, insects. Turtles is this is a hotspot of turtles. In all over the country, we have about 23 species of uh, um, freshwater species of turtles, and out of that, uh, um, we have 21 species in Northeast India. Um, and then Kaziranga, for example, is a place where we have the highest density of tigers in the world. I know, which is neck to neck with Corbett um, uh, and Orang National Park, around 16 tigers per 100 square kilometer, which is really really high. And this is possible because of very high density of prey animals in places like Kaziranga. And as I mentioned, the physiographical biodiversity has raised to several ecosystems in this region. Uh, the grassland ecosystem is one. The wetland ecosystem is another. The tropical fo um, uh, forest ecosystem is the other one, which is um, uh, in the plains as well as in the subtropics of the, um, uh, up to subtropics of the Northeast. Oh, wow. And then also we have alpine ecosystem in Northeast. Uh, I'm here going to talk about present about the case study here today, which is uh, lying within the transboundary Manas conservation area. We call it Tramka, which is actually a, a area between India and Bhutan, uh, the northern part of Assam bordering Bhutan and southern part of Bhutan bordering Assam is the trans identified transboundary Manas conservation area, which we have been working since 2010-11 for, for conservation of this transboundary landscape. And uh, here in the middle is uh, the Manas National Park. Uh, if you if you can see here the green area, and the, on the north of Manas National Park is Royal Manas National Park of Bhutan. Mm -hmm. So it's all together. Oh, this whole oh. area encompasses yeah. about six thousand five hundred square oh. kilometer of forest. And this is the project area um, uh, where um, our projects are worked. Uh, the Manas National Park with three ranges. The Manas is uh, full of uh, wild species diversity, animal diversity. Uh, these are all camera trap photographs uh, from Manas. And there are many photographs I cannot show uh, because of constraints here. But the diversity is very rich. The scenic diversity is very uh, high, very affluent here. Uh, and the mountains of Bhutan guards uh, the Manas National Park on the north. And it's beautiful landscape uh, if you have visited here ever. However, uh, if you see this photograph of rhino, this was introduced back in Manas uh, around 2004 uh, from the from the um, wildlife rescue center. You know why the whole Manas was under a, a socio-political threat uh, for which the entire entire forest area has become vulnerable to uh, extraction by the communities uh, since 1989 to 2003. So that's the roughest period of probably any conservation landscape in the in the country or in Asia. And, and then um, since 2003, the peace established in Manas. As you know, Bodo agitation was uh, one of the very um, you know, prominent agitation in the country with armed conflict uh, with um, authorities in, in Assam. And since then, the Bodoland Territorial Council was established in 2003. The, peace and tranquility has started returning back to Manas, as well as the management and practices of the park also started coming back. With introduction of Rhino, it becomes more prominent because of the uh, effort of the government of Assam to protect Rhino from the poachers. All the Rhinos are extirpated or killed by poachers um, until then. But because of these uh, law enforcement issues uh, that uh, when uh, the park was almost em almost empty from law enforcement agencies, and the park became open to the communities. They started extracting all different resources. They have been extracting for generation, but with the, with the disappearance of protection mechanism, the park became quite open and everybody went in and started uh, working. So before we start our work, we wanted to know what is happening in Manas. So we tried to create baseline and evidences 
to understand what is happening and how we want changes to happen in this. This is called uh, evidence-based based conservation in, in today's, tech, today's terminology. So we identified all different kinds of traits um, uh, in the Manas and, and try to address those traits one by one. And it is not that only law enforcement can stop uh, you know, uh, extraction. And we very well know that. And that's why we designed a program called Manas Tiger Conservation Program. And it is a joint uh, initiative of Aranyog and Forest Department, BTC, Wildlife Conservation Trust, Panthera, and Auli. Uh, the program's main goal was to increase the tiger population by 50% uh, in, uh, by 2024. That was 10 years project goal. And we had major components in the program as law enforcement support, uh, like capacity building of the uh, staff, conservation livelihood, conservation education, and biological monitoring. Um, then if you see the program, uh, the, the Manas Tiger Conservation Program on the image on the top, you can see it has law enforcement, research, livelihood, and awareness all together combined as a um, very uh, you know, integral model. And on the, uh, on the below, the approach is uh, the, the communities who are dependent on natural resources of the park. There is a push effort by the law enforcement agencies, the, for example, forest department, and there is a pull effort uh, from the all uh, from the NGOs and and forest department as well uh, to attract them for alternative livelihoods and also education and awareness for them is uh, what uh, helping them to change their attitude towards the park. Um, and if you see this this image uh, which was established in 2015 2016 uh, from based on uh, data collected in 2015. This is, this is the um, uh, average uh, traits across the park. In the boundary, it's more darker. That means it's pretty intense. And at the north part of the uh, this darker gray shaded areas uh, are less and less. And then some areas which no impacts. We have to exclude the Western range because there was tranquility still not available at that point of time to carry out our work in 2016. So we don't have, did not have data from that area, but we use this data as our baseline. And at this point of time, there were 15 tigers in Manas National Park in this shaded area, the graded area. So we studied, we did an extensive study among the communities, which we call it socioeconomic assessment, and to understand their livelihood patterns um, and dependence on the park. If you see, almost 58% people are dependent on firewood from the park for their stove, as well as for selling them for subsistence. Then there are vegetable collection, tax collection, and also timber collection, which is not always for uh, commercial, but also personal uh, household use. And at that point of time, patrolling was going on. However, if you, if you see most of the patrolling practices we have, uh, the patrol goes early in the morning and late in the afternoon to late uh, early evening. But we, based on our data we collected from the field, we found that the most of the people going inside the park are actually from around 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock to uh, you know, um, uh, three o'clock. So that's the time when there is no petrol available in the park. Uh, if you see that, this is an NTFP collection, the first one, the second one on the right is fisher, fishermen going into the park. So most cases, the park authorities are not able to uh, you know, see the people going inside the park. So we brought out uh, with the help of park authority, we, we created the uh, Manas Tiger Petrol Team. It was a uh, dedicated team who was patrolling the Bhuyapara range, particularly in Manas. Uh, they were trained extensively on various tactics, uh, patrol tactics by experts. We only supported these activities to ensure that the Manas has a better law enforcement uh, uh, team. And daily operations um, of the MPs in Bhuyapara is a regular practice, and they are now practicing this um, absolutely. And this, this helps them to understand where they are going, what they are doing exactly. So the briefing helps them to plan and you know, target some uh, uh, you know, goals for the petrol, which is usually missing. You know? um, they also are able to use uh, equipments and tools for petrol that required like map reading. And also they are trained to you know, uh, uh, interact with the communities whenever they meet and, and, and you know, give them a briefing why uh, they should not come to Manas and how they can be dependent, how can be become independent of Manas by using livelihood efforts given by the, by the local uh, uh, nonprofit uh, as uh, livelihood options. So based on this study we carried out, uh, we 
we selected because we cannot take everyone as our beneficiary in this program. It was, we had limitations. So we selected these categories of people only for, and this selection was supported by the communities. They helped us in identifying these communities, these ind individual households. They are women added marginal, um, uh, marginal, uh, marginal families, landless families and agricultural landless families. There are people who are marginal farmers having only less than two bigas of land and also wage earners, solely dependent on wage earning. So these are the, our target um, um, beneficiaries. And our effort was on uh, family-centric. Mostly we worked with individual families or they are forming groups as a self-help group. And our interventions were like livestock rearing, mushroom farming, fishery, homestead garden-based horticultural farming, Assam lemon nursery and Arakanat nursery. So these were some of the uh, areas we focused mostly. But our, our our primary focus was uh, livestock and homestead garden um, uh, farming, which I will come. And in family, the family can either individually do it or they can um, form a group or join a group to uh, start their uh, um, livelihood activities. And also we got information from the uh, petrol-based uh, um, data that is that is coming from uh, the petrolers. So we, we, we know who are going inside the park uh, where they shared with us. And accordingly, we work with those communities. Uh, so in petrol means, if you see this um, uh, uh, right top right pictures, this woman has been going inside the park several times. She is multiple times going. Every week she used to go, but she was uh, only observed uh, occasionally. So this is one example I'm giving. So then we start a livelihood, uh, alternative livelihood program uh, initiative with her with her choices, what she wants to do. It's very important. So uh, based on these inputs, we have we started seeing impact after three years, not immediately, because conservation livelihood doesn't, come, doesn't happen in uh, overnight, as you know. Um, so we worked with 1,400 households uh, across 31 villages in the Manas landscape in three different ranges. And when we evaluated our work end of this project in 2019, we found that uh, the household carved their dependency from the park resources were 1,344, pretty close to 1,400. So that is, this is an impact. And, and we are not saying that uh, just because uh, this is our project or we want to show success, we want to show failure as well. We have a lot of failures. We will talk about that. It's failure and failure and failure which, when we work with communities. But I think it's more important about persistently pursuing the, pro, uh, the process, pursuing the uh, you know, goal we are uh, into. Uh, and, and this 1344 is not all 100% independent of the park resources. They are still dependent. But that this dependency is to be removed over a period of time, not overnight, as I said. So I'll give you um, a present to three more examples uh, of household level initiative. So the first one is um, Sabitri Burman. She was uh, interested to, she was dependent on park resources for firewood collection and thatch collection. She wanted to do something different. So we asked her, what do you want to do? What is your skill, you know? It was more or lively discussions always with our team members. And uh, she said she wants to produce puff rice making. And when we started in 2015, our baseline is uh, she was earning about 300 rupees per week. And as you see here, <clears throat> she started in 2018 and 2019, end of the 2019, I think that's August 2019, she started earning 1,000 per week without going into the park and using her known skill. This is not something new brought into the system that the women or the, or the people who are, you know, taking these livelihood options as their, you know, uh, source of livelihood. Uh, they need to learn something new. We, we, we try to promote what is available in the landscape, what is traditionally being done, what is culturally suitable for that landscape. These few things are very, very important um, and taken into consideration when we are doing that. And um, uh, the second example is Ganesh Rai. He is an expert in uh, goat rearing. He, uh, once we started, he lost all his goat because of a disease. And then we started providing him goat. He gave only three goats, which he increased up to 21 goats with his personal investment, as well as whatever coming out of this investment. And he started earning 1500 per week. So uh, earlier it was only uh, 1000 rupees per week. So this is how some of these uh, intervention as helping. Then we promoted uh, as well as stressed more on farm-based initiatives in the landscape because farmland is very fertile here and people know how to do farming. As I said, we don't want to introduce something for which 
additional new training is required, new skill development is required. Everybody can grow vegetables, there are no vegetable there, you know. So we wanted to promote that. And this is one example. There are many examples, but this is Khega Bosumotari. He was completely dependent on the uh, park. He used to go every every day. And by 2019, he started earning, you know, uh, 2,500 rupees per week. And now he earns a lot of money, um, uh, a good amount of money, of course, uh, to sustain his family. And he is now part of the farmer producer group uh, that has been established in the area. He is leading that now. Then our impact also includes uh, product development under Mana brand. So we are developing and marketing the product uh, um, using a brand name called Mana, which is Mana specifically in local uh, uh, name. And this is now being um, you know, produced and marketed through a farmer and producer company, which is the new, um, uh, new uh, institution promoted by the government. <clears throat> And what is the impact? Well, how, how do you know there has been impact? So as you know, we have created a baseline in 2015. So if we, we compared our outcome, our impacts based on our additional studies um, at the project and before project and actually. So what is the impact? So if you see uh, changes in income, uh, uh, the people came to high income group compared to the uh, low in, I mean, no income group at the earlier, uh, above 60% actually, um, uh, and, and medium income group was 40 to 60%, which is about 60% of the people came out of that, and 6% uh, household represented. And if you say high income group, 90% household represent, uh, which is 75% income has uh, increased for the communities. Uh, contribution to annual income of the household um, from the farm base, uh, family-centric activities, like the, uh, as we said, homestead gardening and 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 growing vegetables there. And one important thing you have to know: marketing is a big challenge in any conservation livelihood uh, program where we promote uh, products in a in a locality, a pro promotion of products in a locality. Because if the pro if the products is not consumed locally, then it's a big problem because you have to send it somewhere, and that that's where you need marketing linkages. And again, because of middlemen and other, you know, share, sharing uh, needs, the profit goes down for the community, um, for the households. So if you see in this picture, 14.9% of the income uh, coming from livestock farming that we supported. And 23% coming from homestead gardening, which is, which is something that doesn't need new technology, new, uh, you know, capacity building and nothing. And, and uh, mushroom farming, for example, 3.5% income uh, was contributed to the household uh, income. Mushroom, for example, the, the common, local community loves mushroom because also they believe this is good for their health. And whatever mushroom is produced by the communities are all locally consumed, sold locally. No need to take it to the uh, different market at this stage at least. Similarly, contribution to annual income of from group-based activities. If you say, here in group base, our one of the best effort was on cutting and tailoring and weaving. So we march them, uh, we make them dependent on each other. And then trade coloring was one of the group. So almost 14% in all of these three groups, their li uh, livelihood, uh, annual income contribution was 14% to uh, um, uh, um, from the total income in they have. Beekeeping was a little late initiative. We started beekeeping as well. And uh, some of the chalk pencil production and all, again, this has a market need because local schools cannot consume everything. So we had to slowly abandon that because that's not working. So that's a learning that everything doesn't work in a conservation project. Yeah. So um, uh, some quick learning here um, uh, at this stage. Um, so community initiated village forest is one of the, you know, um, what do you call it, sustainability of this project is with the community because we spend a lot of time and effort in awareness. And, and that has led to community understanding how important is the forest, how important is the manas. So they started, you know, forest conservation and spring shade conservation. So village community regular uh, regulation to reduce forest dependency. They themselves uh, started, you know, um, uh, calling regulations. They Even in some villages, they said, if somebody goes to the forest, they will be fined 2,000 rupees. So people stop going there. Community managed nursery is one of the you know uh, things we are living back there. Self-initiated rural ecotourism is another one. 
we have been promoting that and helping the communities. Community driven plantation is uh, where they are, wherever there is community or common land, people are planting in those areas for fire, for uh, greenery and everything. And as I said, this is a result of a large scale conservation awareness program. As I said, our program was integrated, not one of effort only. And all these were monitored. How? Of course, the independent individual component was monitored. The the um, um, uh, livelihood was monitored at household level. Um, the law enforcement was monitored on a monthly basis, like what is the effort of patrol, what is the number of people encountered in the park, how they are going down or not. So I'll come back to some more impacts based on this monitoring. So monitoring was a major component in the project. So if you see from the law enforcement point of view, the patrol team started you know, meeting less and less people after 2018. So uh, uh, these, are, these are like, um, uh, why you might ask a question, why 16 and 17 there was less people? Yes, at that point of time, we're establishing this model. So we had less encounter because we had less priorities of, uh, you know, identifying uh, in, uh, people in the park. So now by 2018, it was all safe. If you see 2018 is the highest, and then it started sloping down uh, to 2021. Similarly, there are different types of trade as I already uh, showed you, firewood collection, cattle grazing, commercial timber extraction, and no blame. Same again, by 2018, the threats were very high as record, and then it started coming down to 2021. So quite a lot of threats has come down uh, inside the park, but there is still an area of uh, 500 to one kilometer from the boundary where we still have uh, anthropogenic uh, resource extraction. As we said, it's a slow push and pull method. It is going to be over at some point of time and forest department is taking very keen interest into that. And all these results turned into our main indicator, the population of tiger. If you see when we started the project in 2015, the first circle, it was 1.5 population density in that area. And it's more than double in 2018-19, and now it's about four. So uh, that's what it is, you know, it is craft. The number of tigers has increased over the period of time. We, we, we said that uh, our goal was increasing tiger population by 50% in 10 years. But actually in six years, I would say, uh, the population has increased by 66%. So that's how tiger can, you know, increase their population if we can provide them uh, a habitat with tranquility and, you know, sanctity, where there is less disturbances, where population of prey animals is sufficient. And also, this the contribution was uh, very important uh, from uh, Royal Manas National Park. So whatever new tigers bred in Royal Manas National Park, they started coming down to Manas and populate Manas, I believe. And also within Manas, there has been good breeding population and good breeding going on because of less of uh, uh, human disturbances. So uh, uh, more or less uh, with this Manas Tiger Conservation Program, we could succeed what we uh, had our set in our goal and what we did with the communities and what we did with the law enforcement, what we did with the biological monitoring are a trendsetter and also has established this model to be replicated in other areas. And given that, and today where I'm sitting now is in Karbi Anglong Hills next to Kaziranga National Park. So I am, uh, we have started developing the similar model based on the learning of Manas model. Uh, and this is where communities are uh, accepting us uh, today after three years of uh, continuous effort. That yes, this is something we can do. It's not that Aranya can do. It's the community they are saying, yes, this is what our communities can do. We will do it and we are doing it now. And this, this model we have improvised in Karbi Anglong because this is not a protected area. This is a community owned forest land, kilometers after kilometers, many square kilometers. But we are currently working in a smaller um, uh, river basin, which is called Kohora River Basin. And in Kohora River Basin, our objective is natural resource management by the communities. So if the communities do the natural resource management, which includes forest, land, water, uh, and air. So our indicator here is not tiger. Our indicator here is not an animal. Our indicator here is the river. So the river water, it's quality and quantity of the charge. I mean, quality, quality of water and quantity of the charge. We hope we can bring this 
entire entire project area at this 30 square kilometer and then expand the models learned here uh, to other areas nearby there will be millions of square kilometer areas to be restored by india by northeast india over the next 10 years as a as a target of uh, un um, goal of uh, you know um, reforestation so i think i think uh, with this i will thank our uh, partners uh, forest department bc uh, Panthera, Aveli, and Wildlife Conservation Trust, and our donor, um, uh, Ayushian and KFW, to support this project, as well as the communities who has been part of this project. And it's it's their project. We just mediated it, basically, and we learned, and, and communities learned. We learned from each other a lot. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you for inviting me for this talk, and uh, I'll be ready for uh, questions at the end of this talk. Um, also, also, if you contact me, I'm available on my email. I am also available on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Just search for my name. You should be able to get it. And uh, uh, thank you very much uh, once again. Give me a moment. Uh, I will come on another device <laughs> to answer the questions because uh, there was some problem here. Yeah. Hello. I would like to request the host to add me on the other device. Hello. 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 Yes. Oh. I can Sir. hear. Hello. Hello. So much, sir. Uh, one minute. Just I ask. Uh, uh, myself, uh, Dr. P. D. Meshram, uh, I am a retired scientist from Tropical Forest Research Institute, Jabalpur. And uh, I was working as a scientist G and group quarter research. And recently, I am working in the faculty of zoology in M.B. Patil College, Sakoli. Sir, uh, <coughs> very nice and informative talk delivered by you. And uh, you have worked on the various... Uh, uh, livelihood approach in the buffer areas and the product development under the that uh, mana bands and uh, you are working in uh, some nursery techniques and some plantations but uh, you have not taken some uh, the bamboo products and the canes particularly in Assam's areas and uh, second as per the FSI report most of the forest covers and the tree canopy that declines day by day and most of these <coughs> that trees are damaged by some biotic factors that is the repeated fire attack some water logging the moisture trace so how you maintain that the habitat <coughs> most of the animals they migrated from the core areas to the fringe areas and nearby the agricultural lands what are the new techniques? What are the new strategies uh, for the conservation of the wildlife? Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I understand your question properly. Um, uh, the first uh, first part I will answer uh, with regard to various livelihood approaches uh, that you have seen already in my presentation. We stressed on something which is doable easily, uh, and and as I said, for example. Mm, government as well as uh, even non-government agencies are also promoting uh, new interventions. For example, uh, strawberry cultivation. For example, dragon fruit cultivation. But if you see, for whatever of these you know produced in the village, there are hardly people who loves to eat strawberries. There are no people in the village who loves to eat dragon fruit. So. Whenever something is produced, that needs to be sent away from the villages, which means you are again putting the people, um, I mean, in a place where they they needs to be dependent on middlemen, and middlemen don't give money to the communities; they exploit. It's very clear everywhere, I believe, uh, not only northeast India, it's uh, central India or north India, wherever you go, middlemen always uh, exploit them. It's the same here. So we did not want to do that. We wanted to start this program with something where they have available skill, traditional knowledge, you know, and, and their understanding about what they are doing. And, and we just help them with 
improvising that little bit, bringing in small amount of uh, you know technology, um, farmy composting, for example. Everybody knows about uh, um, um, uh, local manure, organic manure, but nobody was practicing that way. Other than somebody has a cow shed and there is a cow dung area and they collect that decomposed cow dung and put it in the vegetables. Yeah. That's why. They, so we promoted farmy compost. Uh, um, uh, quite extensively so everybody every household started producing manure for their own you know kitchen garden and the kitchen garden is something that where you can uh, eat yourself and also sell some amount of money it's not that you to reduce your dependency everybody has to be a millionaire over a period of time if everybody is dependent self-dependent then also your reduction on natural resources goes down and that was our fund year we're not trying anything new for example weaving most of the women knew weaving, right? But they are the group of the community who are always stressed. They have to start, you know, household chores, 5 a.m. in the morning until 10 o'clock in the night. Where is the time? So they find only one hour or two hours over the, uh, after the lunch. That's the time they started using their time for production of, uh, you know, um, uh, weaving material. But we wanted to produce them something which is sellable in the market, not that traditional dress, they were because that is only locally marketable. So in these cases, our market was available. In, in, similarly, whatever produce are being produced, mostly locally consumed, but now as the production has gone up uh, slowly, as number of people are in more, so this mana brand is helping them you know, to sell these products. That's first part of your question, I believe I could answer. The other part uh, on the uh, yeah, bamboo. So bamboo is grown there, but the skill to use bamboo to produce something commercially viable was not there. So we did not want to bring in uh, uh, things that is newly uh, skilled, new skill development is required. We, may, we might bring that later on, or government might bring that later on, or yeah, yeah, communities yeah. may start that on their own yeah, later. That, that's always open there, where it's not closed. And then the second part of the question with regard to the destruction of habitat and all that. So uh, my understanding of Zoom when I was studying in the school and the colleges was different. But given that I have been working with these communities for the last six, seven years who are involved in Zoom, it's one of the very important aspects of landscape conservation. We see from the superficially uh, that there is a loss of forest, but there is uh, also forest which is 30, 40, 50 years old, uh, a plot in the Zoom areas, which we don't talk about, you know. And I have, uh, uh, I would due respect to FSI's report. I have serious concern with the report because in uh, you might be reading a lot of cases, uh, the plantations has been considered as forest in FSI report, even including tea gardens. So Assam has uh, Assam has uh, 30,000 square kilometers of um, uh, tea gardens. So you can imagine how much forest it is being sown at this moment. There. So this, this needs to be corrected, of course, for sure. I, I don't want to you know argue on that, but this is the process uh, which we will have to follow. But I think I think otherwise Zoom is one of the important see. I will give another example. During pandemic, we carried out a small study. People who lives in the flat where only rice is grown, we asked them what type of vegetables you could find during the first phase of the lockdown when there was nothing moving. So they said we add locally available four or five different uh, species of uh, vegetables, types of vegetables. We asked to these people who were living in the hills in the middle of the forest. We asked them, what is your vegetable pattern? They said, we had about 15, 16 different types of vegetables during the lockdown. So who is poor and who is rich now? You can imagine out of, out of this. They were more diverse, more rich because of the forest they have. And, uh, and the degradation is part and parcel of this. But yes, Zoom will be more I mean, um, degrading if we consider that uh, the Zoom cycles, if it comes down, but Zoom cycles are going up in Northeast India. It's not going down because uh, people who are doing Zoom has reduced. So eventually the cycle has gone up. That's the general perspective at this moment. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Very correct, sir. Uh, in vermicompost technology, that uh, vermi was yeah, biopesticides uh, for protections of the rice and the vegetable, that is also a very uh, absolutely. Uh, Important. Okay, thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello. Uh, next question. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yes, sir, I can hear you. Uh -huh. So, sir, you have done the lot of work there, uh, in uh, Assam area. So, whatever you have discussed, uh, it is a fantastic uh, 
uh, with respect to community empowerment. Uh, but uh, what the things have been carried out for the sustainable harvesting, okay? Because it is a very important, uh, you can say the program, uh, for you can say the protecting the biodiversity area. Yes, so, sir. Please. Thank you very much for bringing up uh, that question. Uh, it's a very important question. If you see, uh, in, in entire Northeast India, uh, in Assam, we have about uh, 60,000 square kilometer area where there is uh, paddy rice is cultivated. And, oh. and this, is, this is only where rice is surplus. And rest of the areas in Northeast India are all dependent on, uh, you know, some amount of um, uh, paddy cultivation and mostly in, uh, you know, slash and burn cultivation or uh, permanent terraces. Uh, these three types of uh, cropping is there. Uh, I uh, I see that people, even if they have uh, you know um, all these three, still they are dependent on forest, and and most of the extraction resource extraction by the communities at sustenance level probably is not harmful to the forest. But we are victim of commercial harvest. Um, uh, most of from most of these places. The forest produces, particularly aromatic and medicinal plants, uh, are harvested and exploited without following sustainable guidelines, which is not there with the communities, of course. They don't know about sustainable harvest. So that's why we have brought up this uh, Manas model into Carby Hills, where we have two different scenarios completely. In Manas, it's a protected area. You are not supposed to go in and collect resources. But here, the forest is from my backyard onwards as far as I go. So yeah. I can collect anything and everything. There are same um, uh, categories of people here, like omen added families, household without land, household without agriculture land, or household who are all dependent on, only dependent on wages. So these are the same communities we are working. As far as natural resource extraction is concerned, we are coming into that only now. And here, agroforestry is one of our major trust area. From this year onwards, we are going to experiment some of those. But otherwise, we have brought the weaving model. Uh, we have brought the um, uh, ecotourism model here. We have brought the uh, homestead gardening model. You won't believe the first year itself, the omen were so upcoming, so leading. They started you know, doing their homestead garden. Uh, some of them has, did not want to go to Zoom because it's far. They will have to walk every day 10 kilometers. They have small kids, uh, uh, schools, and the house to be to be looked after. So they decided to stay home and do, do homestead gardening supported by us. We had very minimal investment in this, uh, frankly speaking. And they not only add for their own family, they also sold to earn some money from this. We we first year itself, you know, when we started in 2018, they first um, a few families, 10 families we started, they earned. 48,000 rupees altogether just by selling only vegetables and mm. not, not away from uh, their village, within the corner of their village, where there is a small market where four villages collect their vegetables and buy their vegetables. So mm -hmm. they, they just started earning. So now that income has gone up. So our objective is here with natural resource management, you extract natural resources, but you have to minimize that to make it sustainable. We yeah. don't know what is the sustainable rate at this moment. That's That kind of studies are going on and will go on for a longer period of time to understand. For example, you might know Homa Lomena Aromatica, the, the liquid in the good night, for example, the produce from that Homa Lomena Aromatica or many other aromatic substances. Uh, so, yeah. so that is locally collected from here, for example. And uh, they don't know about the price of it. We don't know how much to be collected, you know. So we are also promoting they do this culture because they have a large homestead area and, and uh, agroforestry area. So we are also promoting them to plant this into their area and produce locally within, within homestead itself. You know, So these are the interventions going on at this moment uh, to, uh, to make this model on a natural resource management background at this moment. In Manas, it was not natural resource management. It was, it was a little bit different. It was homestead man mainly managing your homestead area because natural resource extraction in Manas is illegal. Uh, as part of the Wildlife Protection Act. But we had to, you know, um, uh, be on soft. Everybody had to be on soft. Forest women had to be on soft so that people in the meantime changes their livelihood practices to something different, which is more plausible, which is more doable, which is more sustainable uh, within themselves, within the village. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Anybody else uh, willing to ask questions or to have discussion can proceed. Yes, anybody? Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes, please. So I have one question. That sir, uh, uh, in uh, our locality and in uh, many forest areas, uh, many uh, many of the uh, uh, means uh, wherever the plantation is uh, doing, in that case, the many foresters and other uh, peoples they are interested uh, in. We can say the uh, plantation of exotic species, some trees, a uh, uh, few of them. Uh, and I seen that the many of foresters also they are interested for the plantation of exotic species as they gives the highest result in the uh, uh, minimum time. So, sir, uh, uh, there are some guidelines uh, for uh, indigenous uh, plants. Uh, we can say the plantation. And what are the uh, uh, your suggestions that uh, people should go for the indigenous plants uh, uh, plantation in the wherever the plants are found and its own locality. So, what are your suggestions, sir, for all of us that uh, we should go for the indigenous plants uh, uh, plantation and what are the benefits that people yes. should get? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nisikanji, for bringing up this very important question, actually. This is, this is the case everywhere uh, because uh, uh, the forest department, for example, they are also uh, you know, encouraged by the end result. End result is always on monetary values we count, right? And number of trees survive. That's that's the target, actually. How what is the percentage of survivability of it, of a species? You know, that's what comes out. If one hectare plot is uh, you know forested, uh, it's important that that forest grows and it looks like a forest. Whether it's forest or not, that's not important, because if, at the end of the uh, uh, ten years or decadal program, it will be measured from satellite imageries. But most importantly, it's important that whatever we are planting is native. And whatever we are planting is important for the local communities. I'll give you an example. In Africa, if I'm not wrong, it's somewhere in uh, Tanzania. Yeah, yes. uh, the, the government introduced uh, um, eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. Same here. Want, exactly. So they wanted to plant eucalyptus. And they planted eucalyptus everywhere. But the program did not succeed. So yes. they went back later on to the communities. What happened? Uh, they went back to the communities. They went, went. They asked the omen, like, why you did not, uh, you know, care these trees, you know, because the land belonged to omen. Uh, in in that case, whatever they grow, it belonged to omen in this in the culture there. So, so the omen were not interested in eucalyptus because it gives them nothing. It gives whatever eucalyptus is grown, sold by the man, and earned money goes to man man's pocket, not the omen's, uh, you know, basket. So, so they were not interested, right? So it's important to understand that tradition, uh, traditional knowledge is very important when we are talking about afforestation and agroforestry or, or forestry in, in general. What communities want? What is their traditional need? For example, if you plan something which is traditionally, culturally important for them, is not going to be destroyed or damaged by the communities, right? Or, or exactly. they will protect it. Definitely. For example, a ficus tree, is very important for us. It may not be a timber yielding tree, but it gives many, many, it itself is an ecosystem, right? So we can, we can, we, we, it's not necessary that we have to think about only ficus, but in a, in a landscape like uh, Satpura or uh, in a central Indian landscape, other landscape, Nagzira Navigao, for example, there are many native species which are economically important, fruit bearing as well, you know? So it is important to community consult with them, talk to them, what are the species originally found here? What is that you want to plant, you know, in your land? Because it's my land, for example, I would, I want, I have my choices to plant. You cannot give me tick or you cannot give me acacia or you cannot give me eucalyptus. And, yes. and what is the market for eucalyptus? It's again dominated by middlemen. You create something which is not dominated by somebody. Then there will be holistic participation of the communities, I believe. If you create something which is dominated by a market force, then there will be problem. And I think it's important uh, from your perspective, you go and talk about this to the, to the forest department and, and uh, work with them, you know, collaborate with them, see how things can be changed over the next five years. And this is the, um, uh, the decade of eco-restoration. This is the time where India and other countries will be investing 
millions of billions of rupees you know into eco restoration this is the time we should go and talk to them and and see if we can change the perspective the attitude and the outcome uh, 30 years down the line which will be you know beneficial for this whole country the people of this country thank you nishikant thank you sir thank you thank you sir, sir i Definitely. have also two questions sir hello okay thank you yes i can hear hello. you hello sir uh, according to uh, 2019 and 20 uh, forest report okay uh, in northeast there is a 2 1020 square kilometer uh, forest area for a decline okay mm. north yes northeast so what is the main reasons for decline decline in this forest area in northeast particularly sir ah very critical question but first of all i would uh, i would really say that uh, i am not able to rely on this forest survey of india report because of lot of uh, technical issues with that report as i mentioned earlier uh, if you are listening um, the, the the plantations are considered as uh, forest there will be probably more than what they have uh, mentioned yes, um, and this and this um, plantations means even tea gardens uh, coffee gardens everything is coming into um, uh, plantations and these are considered as forest in that report which is, is that a forest um it is already already debated and being debated um, i think this debate will continue but uh, even the uh, director of the fsi has okay. mentioned i think yesterday that uh, in northeast india a lot of plantations has been included in the forest so i think that's a good revelation probably next year onwards probably the survey of uh, forest survey of india will be more cautious in or more maybe they can make it more participatory from the communities Uh, to you know map uh, the uh, the forest areas yes uh, to come back to your other questions on loss of forest 221 square kilometer area of loss uh, probably i don't know i have not uh, seen that in much detail i think 1, it's, coming, it's coming from the it's zoom good. cultivation zoom cultivation and we have lost lot of forest in arunachal uh, which are on the transition zone between the hills and the plains you know so a lot of people from uh, you know hills has migrated to these plain areas because of better amenities uh, of health education and roads and they have started occupying these areas we have lost a lot of forest that way uh, but otherwise i think most of these uh, are contributing from uh, you know slash and burn cultivation and also probably cultivation of rubber cultivation of uh, um, currently promotion of uh, palm palm oil so i would i would request the audience you know when you buy oil just see what oil you are buying you are buying palm oil or you are buying something else but most often we are buying palm oil today and this is going to contribute more forest loss in northeast in the decade to come and second question is sir uh, what is yes. the current status of water buffalo and pygmy hog in uh, particularly in assam sir okay so uh, i don't have the exact number but i think we have around um, 1500 to 2000 uh, wild water buffaloes aesthetic water buffaloes uh, the yeah. census in kajiranga is ongoing i think we will know that very soon and then there is also a population in manas uh, with pygmy hog uh, we have only population wild population is in manas national park uh, we don't know exactly what is the number of wild population maybe around 100 150 and then we have introduced that in uh, we have a program on pygmy hog conservation uh, from arinak uh, in collaboration with darelan uh, um, uh, ecosystems india and uh, with forest department that has introduced about uh, 100 150 um, uh, pygmy hogs in manas um, orang sorry in, in manas orang uh, nameri and uh, sonai rupai wildlife sanctuary so probably we have about 300 individuals at this moment that's what we have okay. uh, in case of pygmy hogs but uh, more information will follow uh, sooner or later when monitoring will be there thank you thank you sir for valuable information thank you yogesh ji so here we are done with the question answer session of first technical mm-hmm. session so sir have discussed and addressed his work about the experience uh, extensive extensive study of communities their livelihood dependency culture at area of manas tiger reserve and how he designed and implemented his integrated model for the wildlife conservation of wildlife endemic to the existing ecosystem sir also explained how he promoted farming to have additional income source a step towards self reliance 
Also, sir has very much emphasized and educated us about the community mobilization and awareness of sustainable utilization of existing resources. Also, lastly, as sir, one of the most important things sir said is persistently pursuing the goal is what we should be looking for and working toward. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for conducting our first technical session. Thank you very much, uh, Anushka ji, and uh, thank you to uh, Madam as well and all other organizers. Uh, uh, I will have to leave because uh, some programs going on. I will have to join that in the village. So I just came out of the program to you know run this session. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. No problem. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Now looking forward for the second technical session. I would like to request our second speaker and resource person, respected Dr. Ajaz Hussain, sir, to present the second technical session. Currently, sir is working with Wildlife Institute of India as project scientist in Ladakh under rationalization of protected area boundary in Ladakh. Uh, thank you, Anushka, for the brief introduction. And uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to thank uh, the uh, chief organizer and organizing committee for uh, this opportunity. And uh, now I'm sharing my presentation. Can you uh, see the presentation or? Yes, sir, yes, yes. I am stopping my video because I have some network issue so that uh, my voice is not, you know, like back during the presentation. No problem, sir. Okay. Okay. So my presentation is about wildlife conservation in the trans Himalayan region of Ladakh. I briefly like introduce you about the background, about the topography of Ladakh and the environment of Ladakh, what type of wildlife species found in Ladakh and what are the what are the threats uh, to the wildlife and what are the conservation you know like uh, uh, what, uh, which are the line agencies or stakeholders or important department you know like involved in conserving wildlife in ladakh so starting with the background uh, the trans himalaya is a vast expanse of cold and arid land encompassing the entire tibetan plateau and it is marginal mountains like in ladakh we have three mountain ranges one is the karakura mountain range in the northern part and the uh, zanskar mountain ranges in the southern part and in the center we have the ladakh mountains Ladakh is located in the western tip of this huge plateau and uh, is the least inhabited areas in India. The, uh, the Ladakh landscape encompasses a tiny populated region with fewer than 3% per square kilometer. Currently, the population, uh, the status of two districts in Ladakh is 335,000 in two districts only. Ladakh has recently been undergoing a substantial change from the patterns of traditional practices uh, farming practices and pastoralism. Pastoralism is most uh, one of the you know like major uh, thing in Ladakh, which is uh, which you found in the eastern plains of Changthang and in Dras valleys and in Suru valleys, where people mostly dependent on livestock and the livestock products. Because of such changes, conservation of the region, natural resources is becoming challenges, especially in uh, 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 the uh, remote areas. Uh, physically and culturally, the area uh, can be roughly divided into Purgis. Uh, uh, we are talking about the culture, these uh, sects. Uh, Purgis, Shina, Dars in the western parts bordering Pakistan, and uh, Baltis, Buddhist, and nomadic herders inhabiting areas in the eastern part bordering China. Visibility. The strategic importance of Ladakh uh, lying at the juncture of several major culture influences. Mm -hmm. Uh, has led to frequency. Am I audible? Excuse me, hello? I think someone is on the line. Forget to mute. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. The strategic importance of Ladakh lying in the juncture of several major cultural influences has led to frequent military conflict is a ladakh landscape share it is 60 percent of uh, area you know bordering uh, be, uh, between pakistan and the economy of ladakh strongly uh, 
Someone is forget to, you know, like mute his, uh, his please. I'm requesting everyone to mute. Okay. Better. No. Somebody has left their mic unmute. Please mute yourself. Sir, please continue. Uh, hello, Kune, sir. Sir, uh, Sir, you have started your video, sir. Sir, please, uh, can you turn it off as we have ongoing second technical session? Hello, Kune, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible now. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 <clears throat> so uh, today, the economy of Ladakh strongly influenced by a large military presence, uh, a rapid growing growth of civil, uh, civil administration structure, and the recent introductions of tourism have uh, greatly influenced the people in the major valleys and are having ever greater uh, effects on those in the remote mountain areas. Sudden change in the associations of people with their surrounding landscape, for example, patterns of livestock grazing, especially in the eastern landscape and the western and the extreme western part, fuel uh, collection. Uh, in terms of fuel collection in uh, areas like Ladakh, we uh, the, the, uh, the people collect uh, dung mostly. And a few, you know, like species like Karagana and Artemisia, they used to collect for winter fuel. And poaching also is there in some areas are important consequences of the economic and social changes and directly affect natural resource conservation, including wildlife in the region. Uh, the process of establishing a system of national park and reserve in Ladakh region is currently occurring with uh, increasing public and private uh, interest. Currently, we have three uh, protected areas, one national park is two wildlife centuries, and we have two uh, Ramsar sites in Ladakh region. Ladakh currently harbors a few of the best preserved natural areas in the uh, uh, natural areas in the more rugged and mountain portions of the Trans Himalaya region. <laughs> the protected area in Ladakh encompasses a core area of unique and relatively undisturbed natural habitat of the endangered and rare flora and fauna found in this uh, landscape. Wildlife found in Ladakh was not threatened in historical time due to generally, you know, like begins association with a sparsely distributed uh, population. But new techniques and government sponsored programs for farming and livestock production have been introduced in changing the livestock breeding, uh, pastoral patterns and farming practices. Such changes will have long term uh, consequences on utilization of natural pasture. Um, natural pasture lands, uh, fuel resources, fuel uh, resources availability, and wildlife conservation, and uh, so the, the same time habitat for wildlife also, you know, like disturbed. Furthermore, a significant military presence in most of Ladakh area, especially bordering with China and bordering with Pakistan, we will found a lots of army settlements in that area. In such area, conservation of wildlife has become very, very difficult because, you know, like security is one of the most important priority things for in, especially in bordering areas. Uh, the increasing number of tourists in recent past in remote areas have impact on land and wildlife conservation. Uh, we'll discuss this later, the impact of tourism on wildlife and um, threats also. The consequences of such development of natural resources and their effect need to be evaluated and integrated into resource planning. Certainly a better understanding and recognitions of the richness of Ladakh wildlife resources and the consequences of modern, de modern development activities on the conservation of its land and wildlife is still challenging in Ladakh landscape. Now coming to the natural environment. Uh, Ladakh became a union territory on 31st October 2019, as all of you know that. Ladakh is renowned for its remote mountain beauty and distinct culture. The UT Ladakh is bonded, uh, bonded to the north by the eastern Karakura Mountains, as I explained earlier, uh, to the south by the western extreme of Himalayas, 
And in the interior dominated by the somewhat lower and drier Trans-Himalayan ranges, that is the Ladakh mountains. The UT Ladakh has two districts, one is Leh and second is Kargil. And the elevation ranges uh, of the landscape is from 2,700 meters, the lowest one, where the Indus River leaves the region uh, to the peak above 7,000 meters in the Himalayan Karakul. Nunkun peaks in the Ladakh, which is around Nunkun Stok uh, uh, Kangri, uh, which is around 7,000 meters. So this portion is, you know, like uh, Kargil district, uh, bordering it is uh, uh, in the in the uh, west part, you know, like bordering with Pakistan. And this portion is the entire uh, Leh district. And somewhere here is the Golwan Valley. You heard about Golwan Valley. And this is Pangong Lake, which is the famous after Three Idiot movie, uh, become the famous, you know, like lake in India. Coming to the uh, vegetation type, the vegetation in Ladakh changes gradually from primarily alpine meadows. We don't have in like in like uh, greater and lesser Himalayas, like they have trees and everything. We have most most of the areas is barren. We can't say barren, but sparsely distributed vegetations. Very small patchy patchy vegetations we have of Koberia, Karaks, Potentilla, Nipta. On the northern side of the Himalaya, the crest of steep vegetation, for example, Karagana is there, Artemisia, Stretchy, Ephedra, and Stipa is there, the most you know, like dominant uh, plants, uh, herbs. To the north in the east with uh, scrubland. Among uh, shrubs, we have hippopy, one of the important things. You heard about the uh, leh, leh berry juice, which is, you know, like come from hippopy. Salex is there. Uh, plantation of salex which starts uh, way back in 1600 or 1400 AD when the um, uh, the you know like uh, Parshins uh, come from Baltistan uh, to Ladakh so they you know like introduce slags and populace in these regions and we have myricaria one of the important species for livelihood people use this myricaria you know like plants for uh, uh, the roofs uh, for making the roofs of their home uh, houses along um, these vegetation mostly hippopy selects and myricaria you will find the uh, along the river courses uh, the region is virtually treeless, except for isolated patches of juniper and bridge in some valleys. Uh, and uh, juniper and bridge is the native, you know, like tree species, which is which found in Ladakh. And mostly cultivated varieties of poplar and uh, willow is there, salex along the major water courses. Currently, juniper and bridge have disappeared from many areas because of, you know, like less snowfall, one thing. And second thing is, you know, like anthropogenic pressure. pressure. Most of the people, you know, like they use juniper and bridge for making their um, like homes uh, and uh, furnitures also. And second thing, they also use these trees for fuel wood, fuel wood, uh, fuel wood also. But in last two decades, you know, like this, uh, the pressure on juniper and bridge, they, um, you know, like suddenly shifted uh, to uh, you know, like uh, on other things, like uh, now in Ladakh, most of the fuel would come from Kashmir. You know, like so. This is the reason why there is now less. We have less, uh, less uh, this uh, pressure on juniper and bridge. Uh, <clears throat> Coming to the wildlife and their habitat. In the photograph, you will see the wild as the Kiang, which is found in the uh, Changtang regions. We have a good populations of Kiang in uh, the Changtang, uh, the, in the eastern plains of uh, Ladakh. Ladakh is of primary concern in terms of wildlife conservation. It is the stronghold of endangered snow leopard, Tibet and sand fox in India, and of two species of endangered wild sheep, that is Ladakh Uriel, which is endemic, and the Tibetan Argali, which is uh, rarely found, uh, you know, like in India, in addition, in the in addition, it uh, uh, it is the habitat of limited numbers of the only population in uh, India of the Tibetan antelope. You uh, must have had shield, you know, like the shawl. Uh, the Tibetan antelope is found in the Changchinmo area, a small population of around 100 and 150 individuals. Then we have Tibetan gazelle in the area of Kalak Tartar and Koyul, uh, which have around 50 to 70, you know, like individuals. Uh, uh, still there. And the wild yak, which is again found in the Chang Chenmo area, which uh, uh, is sharing the borders with China and Pakistan and in the uh, extreme east, it is uh, like uh, shares the border with Afghanistan. And also a small population of endangered Himalayan brown bear still exists in the Suru and Dras region of Ladakh. Uh, brown bear, uh, snow leopard, and wolf are the three main species which involve in conflict with the, uh, with the communities in uh, uh, Ladakh. The threatened doll or wild dog and the threatened palace state are still occasionally made through the region. And the endangered Tibetan wild oars or kyang, which you can see in the photograph, uh, kyang survive in the far eastern Ladakh. Other large mammals include the blue sheep, Asiatic, this Asiatic uh, ibex, uh, Himalayan wolf or woolly wolf, you can say, and lynx. Uh, 
common smaller mammals including the red fox martin otter weasels hare marmots and several species of how uh, mouse and hares uh, uh, or pika found in this landscape large birds including the endangered black neck crane uh, is uh, dr suresh in his presentation yesterday mentioned mentioned about the migration of birds so black neck black neck crane is one of the you know like bird they do the which migrate from tibet to ladakh for breeding so in ladakh we have a lots of wetland and lots of you know like uh, wetland and lakes which provide good habitat for this species to breed uh, you know during summer uh, currently we have around uh, 16 uh, uh, 17 to 19 pairs of you know like this uh, breeding uh, breeding pairs of uh, black neck crane uh, in uh, ladakh besides black neck crane we have golden eagle lama gear uh, uh, griffon vulture himalayan antipatian snowcock and chukar partridge Be besides these uh, um, uh, large uh, birds uh, most of the dogs and waders you know like they migrate from different parts of the world to breed, you know, like in Ladakh, they are um, most of the species. Like we have, uh, till date, we have a list of 360 bird species uh, found in Ladakh. Of uh, out of them, around 70 of, of their summer visitor, and out of the 70 person, around 40 persons are breeders. You know, they only specially come visit Ladakh for breeding purposes. Uh, despite the richness. Uh, of vegetation, uh, sorry, despite the rareness of uh, vegetation, uh, the substantial number of domestic livestock and the very dry climate, the diversity and abundance of wild mammal even today is impressive in this landscape. Furthermore, several rural gorges with relic juniper uh, woodlands, patches of Karagana, patches of Hippophy, patches of Maricaria, stream sites, uh, shoplands uh, are undisturbed slope and undisturbed slope represent nearly pristine wildlife habitat, especially those patches are providing good habitat for the wildlife in this landscape. Uh, coming to the protected area network in Ladakh, as I earlier mentioned that we have, uh, till date, we have one pro uh, national park and two in Ladakh, and besides that, we have uh, two, you know, like Ramsar uh, site in Ladakh. Recently, they are in like 2002 and uh, 2012, and second one is in 2020. Um, you know, like Ramsar had uh, declared those areas uh, for for um, uh, Ramsar site. Uh, the initial action by the state of Jammu and Kashmir has uh, renewed efforts uh, to setting up system of protected areas in Ladakh. The extreme low human population density in some parts of the region has permitted the inclusion of quite large, a uh, quite large area in this proposed system, but much remains to be done to formalize the consolidated these efforts. The first national parks in Ladakh named Himis, Himis National Park, you, uh, you must have heard about, uh, after the prominent monastery was initially designed in 1981 and extended to a area of approximately 4,800 kilometers. Uh, after that, two uh, wildlife sanctuary has been designated. Uh, the Ramsar said, name Corporate uh, Land. This is the map of the uh, uh, protected area found in Ladakh. The red one, this is Himis National Park, which is in the center of Ladakh. The blue one is Prakuram Sanctuary. Uh, yellow boundary is the uh, Changthang Wildlife uh, Sanctuary. And the blue, this one is the first Ramsar site in Ladakh. And this area is Sokar. Sokar is the second Ramsar site in Ladakh. Uh, besides, uh, you know, like protected area, we have a lots of important bird areas, you know, like important bird areas in Ladakh, Zanskar Valley, Chitan Valley, Dras Valley, Suru Valley, Wakha Valley, and Indus Valley. These are the tracks, you know, like uh, human trails and um, the trekking routes, uh, mostly used by the wildlife uh, enthusiasts and bird watchers in Ladakh region. Uh, uh, with this, a substantial 25 to 42 percent of Ladakh will have protected area status. But the but the realization of even a portion of this proposal will necessitate a close cooperation between conservation and development authorities in uh, the state. Uh, this area is uh, in this map. You can see this area. This is the Dras area, which is uh, the I think uh, in Ladakh we have only this uh, the brown bear surviving brown bear population found in this area only. Now the uh, current government proposed two centuries again. One is the Dras area in this portion, and second is Zanskar and Suru region, which is again a important hotspot area for wildlife. 
coming to the land use and wildlife abundance uh, people have been living in the in high mountains of ladakh for several thousands of years it was reported that uh, there were substantial reduction in populations of wild mammal in the introduction of domestic livestock especially in the eastern part of ladakh you will find a lots and lots of livestock because the economy first thing and second thing is the livelihood dependency of the local community are totally on livestock products for example pashmina wool dairy products meat uh, this is the reason why the population of livestock in that far eastern part and the uh, far western part far western side is increasing year by year yeah, because people earns a lots and lots of money um, because of the excessive grazing pressure by the livestock and exploitation of pasture land, competition with wildlife is, you know, like very common in Ladakh. Yeah, everywhere you will find ibex, you will find blue sheep is, you know, like grazing with uh, uh, livestock. Kyang is grazing with the yaks. Even gazelle and argali they are uh, grazing with the sheep and uh, sheep and uh, sheep and goat in many areas. It is unlikely that wildlife habitats are remain unchanged by the influx of people in their uh, in their livestock. The introduction of domestic animal grazing altered the original steep community to come extend, but this probably resulted in proportional differences in species composition. In few areas, the population of large predators were probably also reduced because of poaching, because of conflict with the local community, um, of declining populations of wild prey, and also the declining populations of wild prey in few areas. Because when there is a competition with the livestock, the wild population, they shift in such areas where there is less competition. So this is the reason why earlier we found um, when we when we used to be kid, uh, we used to saw snow leopard and you know like uh, wolf in our vicinities. But uh, in today's uh, time, we only see you know yaks, horses, goats, and sheep. This is the reason why the wild prey population you know so they shift in the upper ridges in the areas where there there is less conflict. And same with the the prey, uh, same with the predator species, they all also shift with the um, wildlife. The high uh, open plains and grassy slopes of Changthang, Suru, Draz, and Zanskar region of the eastern Ladakh have long support pastoral nomadic communities, especially Changpas in the eastern part. Uh, these herders live it off their livestock and dependent on livestock products. Livestock uh, provide, as I earlier discussed, milk, cheese, pashmina, wool, and skin for clothing, dung used as fertilizers, and also in winter seasons, you know, in winter season, people you, uh, sell uh, dung. Uh, uh, for you know, like uh, uh, in some area, large herd, uh, large herds of wild grazing competitors such as antelope, gazelle, sheep, and yak indicates a coexistent pastoral practices uh, community. As you can see clearly in this picture, uh, the uh, kyangs these are the wild kyangs found in the <laughs> Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. I'm requesting yes, audible, sir. Sachin Katakar, sir. Please uh, unmute yourself. Uh, mute yourself. Oh, thank you very much. So you can clearly see in this picture, you know, these are the wild, uh, wild, uh, you know, like uh, called Kyang wild asses, for, uh, which is um, in uh, trans uh, in the Changthang region. And you can also see the livestock. They're grazing together in a particular wetland. This wetland is called uh, Hanle wetlands. So wildlife abundance were graphically documented through Ladakh in recent parts. Uh, a survey in the region by different uh, um, uh, organizations, different wildlife organization, as well as this central government also you know like running so many projects in Ladakh for uh, to know the status of wildlife in uh, this area. Uh, subsequent dramatic uh, decreases in many wildlife population in increasingly accessible areas of Ladakh were also reported. <clears throat> Still, thousands of blue sheep, burial, and apex remain, uh, remain in the relatively inaccessible uh, mountains areas of Ladakh, and the snow leopard and wolf appear sometimes near to human settlement because of the conflict. Because most, uh, because uh, snow leopard, wolf, they now they are looking for the easy prey. So the easy prey becomes your livestock, sheep, and goats. So this is the reason they are most, uh, most of the time, you know, like in conflict, snow leopard and wolf appear. Culturally and spiritually, wildlife has an important place in uh, uh, place the livestock, uh, lives of Ladakhis, uh, especially the ibex, the snow leopard, and uh, there are a few birds, uh, for example, the black neck crane, uh, are the uh, symbols of 
uh, symbols of good luck and prosperity. Uh, beside these, uh, there are also numerous rock carving of uh, wildlife, which indicates a close association with natural uh, world. In many areas, you will find rock carving in Ladakh. Uh, there are many proverbs, uh, uh, proverbs of flock, uh, flock stories, flock songs, and um, uh, stories in Ladakhis um, about wildlife and its importance. Now, coming to the the threats uh, to uh, wildlife. So one of the major threats to wildlife in Ladakh is the increasing, you know, like stray dogs or feral dogs in this landscape. As you can clearly see in this picture, a dog is chasing, you know, like barred uh, geese. And second, uh, in the second picture, you know, like dog is chasing kyang. And in the third picture, dog is chasing, you know, like brown bear. It's, it's in the rust. So it is one of the major challenges for wildlife. Wherever you go in Ladakh, you will find and lots and lots of stray dogs in cities, in villages, everywhere. But there is a difference. For example, if you go, to, uh, if you move towards uh, the uh, western uh, parts, which is dominated by Muslim communities, in that area you will find a lots of uh, you know like red foxes because Muslims don't you know like keep dogs. So in that area, zero you know like you will you will find no dogs. So when you will visit it, you know, like especially district like Kargil, you will find a lots and lots of uh, these uh, red foxes, uh, small mammals, uh, wolf, because there is no competitor, uh, especially the uh, stray dogs. But if you move towards from north to east, the population of stray dog increases and increases and increases because in the, the eastern parts, the area is dominated by Buddhism and the Buddhists have a culture to not to kill and not to harm any, you know, like living creatures. So this is the reason why this, you know, like, Stray dogs is boost, you know, like their population is boosting every year, you know, like now in Ladakh, we have like more than 12 or 13,000, you know, like stray dogs uh, in Ladakh. Second threat is the increasing tourism. You can see clearly in the photograph, you know, like while uh, this, uh, you know, like tourists, you know, like they're feeding these marmots, red foxes and blue sheep, so which is again become a threat. All the, you know, like wildlife, they become obese, especially these photographs we are taking from the Pangong area. And second thing is in this photograph, you can clearly see people feeding the, uh, you know, like brown headed girls, which are migratory, you know, like um, birds, they come here to breed and the tourists, you know, like they take their vehicle near to their lakes and near to the important habitat for wildlife and start feeding this uh, um, wildlife, uh, wildlife species and everywhere tourists, they wherever they want, they camp, you know, like they take their vehicle and camp. And second thing is this photograph is taken from Pengo. And one person, he's from, I think, Delhi or somewhere, I don't know. So he put his vehicle in the, uh, in the, in the lake. So these are the threats. And the important, one of the important discussion, one of the important thing is the increasing, you know, like garbage dump. You can see in this picture, dumping Ladakh is the uh, site just behind the city of Leh where you know like people used to dump you know like their garbages so this is again a threat but uh, there are few local people who have concern for this so they aware people uh, for how to use you know like uh, manage the garbages so they uh, make such things you know not use me and uh, dustbin and all and distribute it in different areas especially in tourist influence tourist high populated areas now coming to the wildlife uh, uh, conservation in uh, ladakh uh, wildlife conservation concerns are in, uh, premount with the context of the recent and counting establishment of protected areas and other conservation areas in Ladakh, most of which including human population and traditional agriculture grazing land use and other land use, right? Similarly, money line agencies recently urged the component authorities uh, to promote and incorporate the information on indigenous traditional conservation practices in the coal uh, arid landscape of Ladakh region into current development and conservation program. In 2020, one uh, uh, large project was, uh, you know, like started in Ladakh, uh, especially in the name of uh, carbon neutral in Ladakh. So many line agencies, they take part and many line agencies participate. And in that uh, uh, program, uh, most of the line agencies, they uh, focuses especially the traditional way of uh, living of people traditional way of you know like uh, infrastructure traditional infrastructure traditional you know like uh, system of heating rooms so tra traditional systems of heating water because in 21st century we are using most you know like electricity we are burning coals we are burning woods which again creates a lots of pollution in the air uh, 
fundamentally, this implies that local knowledge and participations are included in formulations of conservation action, which although eminently logical and uh, straight, uh, um, uh, straight forward. Money line agencies uh, and important stakeholders in Ladakh are involved local community and conservation of wildlife program. The different stakeholders in Ladakh who work for wildlife conservations uh, are uh, Forest Department, Wildlife Department, Defend, uh, Defense, uh, Defense Institute of High Altitude Research, National Research Institute of Sowaripa, Wildlife Institute of India, Wildlife, uh, World Wildlife and WWF, uh, Snow Leopard Conservation Trust, GB Panth is there, uh, the Tropicalist Trust in Kargil, UN, uh, UNDP is there, Wildlife Conservation and Bird Club, and the SIGMA, the Student Education and Cultural Movement of Ladakh. Uh, the Forest Department and Wildlife Protection Department working together, and recently uh, they, you know, like complete their um, uh, two projects of NMHS in which they did uh, uh, the MLP macro level planning of the entire region of uh, Ladakh. They cover most of the uh, villages and areas uh, to know the status of the livelihood or in, uh, in villages and second thing is they did camera trapping in the entire Ladakh region covering more than 60,000 square kilometers to know the wildlife abundance in important areas for wildlife for future protection uh, and the third important thing the forest department and wildlife protection departments are doing they are um, you know like providing homestays uh, eco cafes in areas uh, where wildlife uh, where wildlife tourist uh, uh, abundance is more the different Institute of High Research is mostly work on vegetation, uh, local agriculture products, and uh, the and uh, promote uh, the local people uh, to you know like uh, work in agriculture agricultural line and so on something. Now, and the National Inst Institute for Sowaripa and the Tropicalist Trust. They work for medicinal plants in Ladakh because Ladakh is a place where you can find a lots and lots of amchis. The local, you know, like doctor, we, we call amchis, the local doctors, they use Ayurvedic uh, products and they extraction, they do a lot of extraction for wild uh, these uh, floras. Uh, so uh, the uh, National Research Institute and Sawarikpa and uh, the uh, Tropicalist Trust, they start, uh, you know, like awareing people, awareing especially the amchis and they also uh, teach them how to grow those important medicinal plants in their you know like agricultural field so they have a they also workshop and uh, uh, this uh, uh, awareness program especially for those who are totally dependent on the uh, uh, wild uh, floras in uh, the uh, ayurvedic uh, part wildlife institute of india is working in the landscape from last uh, from past uh, three to four decades and they have a lots of projects running in this uh, landscape uh, currently they are working on different uh, uh, currently, they are working on different uh, projects, for example, the distribution of important uh, uh, important uh, critically endangered species in the area by coloring them, by radio coloring those species to know their home ranges and important habitats. And second thing is now the Wildlife Institute of India, uh, UT uh, Ladakh and the uh, Wildlife Protection Department, Forest Department are together working on a project in which I'm currently working, that is the rationalization of boundaries in Ladakh, in which we are working to, you know, like restructure or really uh, shape the uh, Bond uh, the two centuries that is Karakuram and Jangtang wildlife centuries, and uh, besides this, uh, there is uh, a Snow Leopard Conservancy Trust (WWF) who works special mainly for human wildlife conflict. They provide a lots and uh, um, uh, lots of you know like. Um, uh, uh, Coral fencing, one product and second product. Product is early warning system and the uh, fox light to reduce human wildlife conflict in particular area. Besides this, these uh, two agencies also provide uh, uh, homestays um, material uh, in villages for homestays, especially in areas where wildlife abundant. Uh, is there gb Pan recently start their few projects for on vegetation and undp mostly work on wetlands and wetland health and they uh, current uh, they they recently complete the wetland cards for the entire ladakh region and uh, beside this uh, we have uh, two or three local ngos like wildlife conservation and bird club of ladakh which is totally you know like uh, made by the local uh, youths who are uh, totally interested in bird watching and wildlife conservation. So there is a club, they, um, you know, run awareness program in different, different villages. They teach the people the importance of wildlife in such areas. And uh, the SIGMO, you heard about the, uh, um, uh, this uh, ice stupas, ice stupas and artificial village. So the work uh, of ice stupas and glaciers, uh, these uh, artificial glaciers, you know, they work under this uh, SIGMO. So 
these are the important uh, stakeholders, uh, especially conservation of wildlife in Ladakh region. And they run lots of projects and they're doing uh, in work in different, different areas of Ladakh for conservation of wildlife. Beside this, there are threats uh, which need to be addressed uh, to concerned departments uh, for that uh, different uh, local people and local NGOs are working. Uh, for this, I would like to thank everyone for the patience listening. Thank you very much. Any questions and suggestions, please, uh, most welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we are open for uh, discussion. Uh, hello. Sir. Hello, sir. Ajaz, sir. Uh, salam. Uh, so fantastically you explain all these things uh, we are very much uh, you can say inspired by your work particularly uh, one thing that uh, you have shown one slide uh, the wild ash there is existing in Ladakh region na? yes sir uh, so wild ash is also existing in the you know, Kutch, the Kutch, region, of the Kutch region they are the same species but I think the Kutch one is the subspecies you see you see that the topography of Ladakh and Kutch is entirely different and different. the climatic condition is entirely different mm -hmm. yes, sir, here yes. there is a minus 30 temperature and in yeah. uh, you can say there is a plus 50 in Kutch yeah. region yeah. Uh, so is there any you can say uh, uh, build up change or you can say uh, then uh, among the animal, um, particular the species of the wild ash. Uh, I don't have much idea about that, sir, because I know only about the species which found in Ladakh. I never work in uh, Kutch. But okay. the literature says they are, uh, you know, like um, a same species. Okay. But must be, there is not a particular study which shows that uh, you like there okay. uh, the you know like one is subspecies one is the main species uh, okay, but for okay. their build up i can i can't say that uh, what is the difference because i don't have idea about the uh, species found in the patch okay second thing is that uh, once i visited there in ladakh valley eh? yes sir twice i have visited there in ladakh valley and when i visited janskar particularly so most of the construction of a uh, road is uh, going on that time uh, so because of this, uh, you can say linear construction. So I think that uh, uh, destruction of the um, hills and the mountains are there. So because of this kind of construction yes. work, is there any psychological uh, changes among those particular species and their uh, natural, uh, you can say, movement of the wildlife or some migration, local migration is taking place? Uh, is there such kind of issues are there? Uh uh, recently, we started a walk especially on this, you know, like what yeah. is the impact of construction of roads? Because uh, in 2020, there was an, uh, you know, like um, road uh, walk started from Kargil to Zanskar, which connects yeah. Zanskar to Himachal, okay. uh, which is a four line highway. So in that areas, we are working on this. And yes, there are, uh, you know, like in case of brown bear. You know, like brown bear face a lot of disturbance when there is a construction of road, constructions of, you know, like buildings and construction of uh, other, you know, like, uh, uh, especially the defense areas. So they change their habitats. So they move towards, you know, areas where they, uh, there is less disturbance. Yes, there is, you know, like, uh, for example, especially in uh, high abundance areas, for example, Himes is there, we have Lama Yuru uh, uh, area and we have the Chiktan area where we have lots of uh, lots, uh, lots of, uh, of uh, these ibex and urial when we have you know like when the construction of road is there so they you know like change their movement pattern in that areas yes definitely there is some effect. okay okay and uh, especially one thing that our audience wanted to know about it because we resides in the central india landscape and you see the plain area is there and very strong uh, you can say network of the roads uh, railways etc uh, as far as the topography of Ladakh is concerned, so everywhere there is a mountain, okay? High yes, mountains sir. are mm. there and it is very high, very difficult to reach everywhere to, to yes, the, yes, every sir. destination. Mm. So what kind of extra preparation and the kind of psychology is needed to work uh -huh. particularly on the wildlife conservation? Uh, that uh -huh. especially you focus this one for our audience and the student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mostly when we, you know, like visited in far flung areas where connectivity is very less, we yeah. uh, take help from the uh, Indian Army because Indian Army is posted everywhere and they have, you know, like uh, roads 
and uh, everything. So you need the yeah. Indian Army Commission to visit far flung areas. Besides that, there are areas, you know, like uh, most of the area in Ladakh now, they're connected with roads after 1999 war with Pakistan. And recently, you know, like the conflict with Goldman. So India government is, you no, know, our government is, you know, like um, giving lots of focus, especially in Ladakh region to build roads in all areas. But in far flung areas, especially the Changchenmo area, the Changdang, Koyul and Demchok areas, if you want to walk there, you need permission from the army. They will provide everything. You, okay. uh, you provide vehicle as well as accommodation okay. also. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, as you mentioned about the new development project in Qatar, Anushka, you are not very good. Your voice is very good. Uh, sir, is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yes. yes, sir. So, as you sir mentioned about the new development projects by government in the Ladakh region, mm -hmm. and uh, they will probably having consequences. So, sir, developing infrastructure is a need of today's time. So, are there any uh, sustainable approach adopted by the government till now? As you said, many government and non-government institutions. Yes. Like, for example, there is a uh, one thing that, you know, like when you talk about development is, you know, like conservation via development and development via conservation is very important. So, whenever there is a developmental project in Ladakh, they need environmental impact assessment report. So that environmental impact assessment report will provide it, uh, provide by, you know, like Wildlife Department, Wildlife Institute of India or Wildlife Department or Forest Department. Before starting that, infra, yeah, the, any, you know, like projects, infrastructure work, road uh, connectivity, we have now, you know, like uh, 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 Government of India, you know, like they are interested in, you know, like build railway lines in Ladakh. So now we are working for the uh, environmental impact assessment. Actually, we see the particular area and we do which uh, are the important things from that, that area. Uh, is it, you know, like time to, uh, you know, like start construction in that area as a lot. After the environmental impact assessment, government can start their work. And second thing is, area like Ladakh, that development is very important because so we are sharing our borders, you know, like most of the countries with China and Pakistan. So in such areas, you know, like wildlife becomes secondary priority. This is it. And, uh, you know, like development becomes one of the important things. But beside this, money department, money line agencies, as I earlier explained that, you know, like working for conservation of wildlife. Any developmental work, if you want to, you know, like government want to start in Ladakh, they need environmental impact assessment for component authorities, for, you know, like component department, like forest department, wildlife department, wildlife institute of India is there, WWA is there, UNDP is there. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So, any more questions? Anybody? Does anybody have questions? Okay, so, I guess now we're done with the second technical session's question answer. So, sir has explained the geographical setup of Ladakh topography, species distribution, endemism of species, vegetation distribution, etc. Also, different uh, berry plants and its importance for the livelihood of Ladakh people. Sir has emphasized on the distribution of wild ass and their endangered brown bear, red fox, martin, and how they have been acquainted with the spectacular topographic climate ecosystem of Ladakh. Sir also elaborated the special efforts by the governmental agencies and people participate in Ladakh. Sir has explained the threat of wild dog to other species and threats of tourism to wildlife and garbage dumping and ecosystem graduation and collaboration agencies working for wildlife conservation in Ladakh. Thank you very much, sir, for educate, educating us about all of these. Thank you so much. Sir, for conducting uh, thank, us. You, thank you very much. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank the organizer, the organizing committee for this, uh, you know, like opportunity. And it is uh, one of the best, you know, like platform to share your experience and to, uh, you know, like speak about your landscape and the wildlife found in area. And uh, uh, after UT, you know, like there is a lot of opportunity in Ladakh, especially those who are interested in wildlife, those who are interested in vegetation, those who are interested in birds, those who are interested in tourism, socioeconomic. So, lots and lots of, you know, like, now 
now is uh, starting and it will be you know like in future there's uh, lots of project is coming from different as aspects so i'll uh, but uh, but simultaneously it will be more tougher to work in ladakh for we people huh? that uh, we are all the climatic condition of ladakh no no sir currently uh, 12 researchers you know like who working under me they are all from from maharashtra from mumbai okay okay they are, they are working right now they are here in ladakh yeah, yeah. they are working with the drdo okay the idea also in wildlife institute of india we have yeah, a team yeah. of 14 people uh, okay, working okay. on rationalization of this so ladakh is not a tough area to you know okay. like walk. whenever i whenever i could have a chance to visit again once ladakh huh? definitely i will see you huh? oh sir have please, a very please, nice sir. discussion with you please sir please 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 you are most yes, welcome sir most yes welcome. sir definitely thank you sir thank you very much sir thank you so much sir uh, we all are privileged to be here with you Anushka, uh, Anushka, you are uh, not audible. Unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So, as we have successfully conducted both the technical sessions, I would respect. Uh, I would request respected Joint Secretary of this E Conference and Professor and Head of Department of Geology, M. B. Patel College. Dr. C. J. Kune sir, to propose a vote of thanks and sum up our today's conference. Hello, hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it is my proud privilege to propose the vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of those. who really work hard to make this event possible in this today's nationally conference on wildlife conservation in india a sustainable approach jointly organized by department of zoology jm patel college bhandara mb patel college sakoli and sn mor college tumsar in collaboration with wildlife trust of india and anvocare nature club under dbt star college scheme we extend a hearty vote of thanks to our inaugural chief guest and keynote speaker Mr. Manikand Ramanujan, IFS conservator and field director, Nagjira Navigao Tiger Reserve, Gondia, who spared time from his busy schedule to grace the occasion and enlighten us on wildlife conservation. Thanks you very much, sir. And yesterday he had an opportunity to hear your thoughts on wildlife conservation, and this will be surely be going to encourage all of us to come forward for wildlife conservation in our region. We. take this opportunity to thank our distinguished resource person of the first day of this e conference in technical session 1 mr luis jos luis deputy director wildlife crime control division wildlife trust of india new delhi for the information he shared on snares a tools for hunting great threats to wildlife conservation we are thankful to the resource person of technical session 2 dr suresh kumar scientist e wildlife institute of india dehradun india the session is really very informative on migration of birds especially amur falcon pied kaku and sarus crane which definitely motivate our faculties and students to initiate wildlife conservation approach and work for sustainable future of society and nation on second day of this in conference in technical session 1 we are thankful to dr mohammad firoz ahmed head trcd and hrcd aranyak guwahati assam india for accepting our invitation as a resource person and giving such informative presentation on wildlife conservation in northeast india a sustainable approach he has mentioned the wildlife uh, such as rhinos 2450 uh, tigers 220 and focused on capacity building in including uh, conservation livelihood approach and for food development such as rice and vegetables in technical session 2 we are uh, grateful to dr azaz hussain project scientist protected area boundary ladakh india for accepting our invitation as a resource person and shared his most valuable experiences on wildlife conservation at a very tough topography of ladakh 
he focused on salis plantation about the endangered animals like birds black neck train and he mentioned 360 species of birds uh, animals such as snow leopard and uh, threat to the wildlife conservation i am very much thankful to chief organizers of this e conference dr vikas dhomne principal jm pradesh college bhandara dr harish trivedi principal mb pradesh college sakoli dr chetan kumar masram principal sn mor college tumsar and mr prafull bhamburkar coordinator central india tiger corridor securement project wildlife trust of india we are grateful to dr kartik pannikar ipac coordinator jm pradesh college bhandara for technical support in the organization of this national e conference thank you sir we express our thanks to dr lp nagpurkar organizing secretary and associate professor and head department of chemistry and program officer anvokar nature club mb pradesh college sakoli for his nice introductory remarks during inaugural session and support i must mention our deep sense of participation <coughs> and appreciation to dr mahendra raut field officer and wildlife trust of india for briefing us about wildlife conservation we are thankful to dr sham dafre coordinator dpt star college scheme and head department of chemistry jm patel college bhandara for taking a keen interest in organizing this e conference we express our thanks to dr veena mahajan convener and head department of zoology jm patel college bhandara for conducting the proceedings of both the technical sessions so nicely we would like to th- express my thanks to miss anushka singh uh, working uh, with uh, anvokar nature club for introducing the resource persons and proceedings of the today's technical sessions we express our thanks to dr mf jadav co convener and head department of zoology snmr college tumsar for their support and giving vote of thanks of the first day technical session with the research persons we would also like to express my thanks to dr kanchan khapande madam assistant professor department of zoology mb bagal sakoli arti sarve madam assistant professor department of zoology snmr college tumsar and uh, dr Kirs- kirsan assistant professor department of zoology jm pradesh college bhandara for their support an event like this cannot be happen overnight the wheel started rolling weeks ago it requires planning and birds i detail we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very proactive and dedicated staff i am short of words for their involvement and their willingness to take on the completion of the task beyond their comfort zone we are thankful to the teaching and non teaching faculty members and students participants of jm pradesh college bhandara mb pradesh college tumsar and snmr college <coughs> tum sir mb over sakoli uh, <coughs> the office bearer science club of the wildlife trust of india and anvokar nature club and our ben- beneficiary institutes such as nutan kanya high school bhandara bansila lahuti nutan maharashtra school bhandara thank you all for your motivation and support on behalf of the organizing committee i also express my indebtedness to all those who directly or indirectly helped us in organizing this national e conference and uh, after all feedback link will be sent on telegram group and e certificate will be issued only those who will send feedback form last but not the least we express our deep sense of gratitude to the department of biotechnology ministry of science and technology government of india new delhi thanks you all again thanks lot and i declare the e conference is concluded here thank you thank you so much anam oh, here uh-huh. over here over here over here